announced several cuts, you know, uh, to taxes, mm -hmm. reductions in some taxes, and um, explains that these are all to reignite the economy. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, I would just say that's a bit. Um, it's really unfortunate for the country that uh, I remember in 2010, as Deputy Finance Minister, everywhere you went in the world, I mean, this was a country that has so much promise. Uh, we were just basically entering into the oil era. And uh, everybody saw this country as a real uh, shining beacon uh, that was actually giving promise to the, to, to, to the world. Um, we went through that period all the way to, let's see, 2013. Uh, in 2013, especially as a result of single spine salary, which we had just finished in the year 2012, the arrears became a difficulty. And so that really was the beginning of the difficulties we had from 2013. In spite of all those difficulties, we still had an economy that you call, in terms of rating, was at least a minimum of a B, B minus. Uh, you had foreign investors that still had a lot of confidence in. Uh, despite the difficulties that doom saw itself brought about, uh, we were finishing 2016 still with an economy, even though our friends came into office, created the impression it was such a bad economy. In truth, it was an economy that anyone would be happy to inherit. Why? Because the foundations were strong enough for you to be able to accelerate. We were still in the IMF. That's true. That's true. But we're talking about an economy that, even as at the close of 2016, the IMF, the World Bank, and all other uh, international financial I mean, uh, bodies knew was going to grow a minimum of 8%. Why? Because of the work that had been done ahead of it. We're talking about an economy that, at the close of 2016, even in terms of CD depreciation, maximum 9.6% depreciation of the currency. Uh, we're talking about even though growth was just about 3.4, as I said, the foundations was already present to lead to a growth of 8% the following year, and not so close to 8% the year after because of those, uh, shall I call it, legacy of infrastructure that had left. Now, to see us just within a matter of a few years reach a level where we have become what you call a junk economy, in spite of the fact that over the period 2017, up to the year 2020, the resources that were available to us, not only in terms of the oil resources, in terms of tax resources, in terms of even borrowing that was available to us, we shouldn't be in the position in which we are today. A position where virtually all hope is gone. The economy has become so, so, so down that virtually all portfolio investors literally have no interest. Are you we not are ignoring the two big issues? COVID and Ukraine, you didn't have to worry about such I know that. You know, external I know factors that. when you were in office. It's true. COVID and Ukraine definitely did happen. But you know, the truth is that COVID and Ukraine was not isolated to Ghana. And uh, no other country in the sub-region or the continent of Africa have gone through what it is we have gone through. Are in fact, worst? in our case, in our case, COVID actually was more of a blessing than a curse. Because the resources that we got access to during COVID, I mean, could you let me tell you, between uh, uh, 2009, when Prof. Mears took over, all the way to 2016, when John Mahama exited, the total uh, borrowing, total borrowing we had, because we took borrowing almost a 10 billion, and ended about 120 billion. So it's about what, 110 billion of borrowing within that space of eight years. Within just a few months of COVID, let's say uh, between July to December of 2020, the resources that came through as a result of COVID alone was amounting to in the region of at least 40 billion. I'm talking about eight years, 110 billion cities. And within just four months, you are getting access to what? That's almost half of what we had for eight years. You have no reason to complain. And in spite of that massive resource envelope, 
you still got a deficit, the highest in our history, about what, 15% plus deficit. You had a growth that was what, doing less than 1% growth. You had an economy that was so bad that it literally brought about inflation and all the problems. Debt became so high that we could no more money. So you can't use COVID as an excuse. You can use Russia and Ukraine as an excuse. So I'm saying that this budget for me, hearing the finance minister talk about victory, because uh, I can only tell you that uh, it's sad what this country has been reduced to. Because, you know, I know it's all sometimes all about politics. We need to maybe create the impression that things are better than they ought to be. But how can you actually seriously talk about victory when you supervise inflation to the point where inflation had reached 50%? And simply because you have seen inflation inch down, you think there is victory? How could that be victory? It's the right direction. That's what they would say. How could that be victory, Kojo? Because the truth is this, that uh, no matter who is in power today, if you are no more, no more servicing debts, inflation naturally will inch down because there's no pressure on you. All the money that normally you would have used to be able to pay your debt, that literally had been, you have a moratorium. So you don't have pressure. So inflation inching down is nothing to write home about. It's just a normal thing that must happen. But the question is, why on earth should we even reach that level in the first place? For us to even be now be talking about inflation now should be something that we celebrate. So uh, I'm, I, I just feel really very sad for this country. When I see exactly what, what has now become just nothing but anything just for politics. Because I would have been expecting the finance minister the Vice President Baumia, the President, if anything at all, they should be super remorseful. They should be penitent. They should constantly be pleading with the people of Ghana to forgive them for supervising this absolute abysmal situation that the country has been plunged into. The loss of hope in terms of our young people, the destruction of the personal finances of any people who have worked hard and now are pension. I mean, the, 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 the unemployment situation, the, the whole despair is not something that anyone should boast about. But we are talking about people who feel this game is all about politics. Let me throw about some words, hoping that that may help me again to win politics. And politics is exactly why this whole thing happened. Could you? Because all this problem I just narrated, the one thing brought it about, the desperation to win in 2020, regardless of consequences. All that talk about Ukraine and Russia is just a lie. It was simply political desperation. So for example, all these COVID funds, you know, the, the, the Auditor General's report will tell you exactly what it was. It was basically thrown about as confetti, given to party apparatchikis, and just basically used around for pure pro I mean, political purposes. And at the end of the day, the people of Ghana are paying for it. You, you do all this free water and free electricity, you turn around immediately after you win power to slap what you call taxes on the people, COVID days and every just to take back, I mean, to, to, to inflict pain on the people. Then you expect the people, of God, the people of Ghana to be excited because what well, you have brought inflation down from 50 to what, 30 something. That's nothing the people of Ghana should be happy about. So, I mean, for me, the, the, whole, um, the whole budget is just a typical MPP for you. A group that is simply become so, should I call it so, impervious to, 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 to the pain of the people that as far as they are concerned, listen, just keep spinning, keep spinning, keep spinning, hoping that somehow you can deceive the people. And it's sad. There's a sense of deja vu about something you said. You know, you talked about how uh, you would expect the president, the finance minister, the vice president to be penitent. Yeah. You would expect them to be, you know, apologizing Absolutely. to the people. It's, it's a sense of deja vu about it because okay. in the last year of uh, President Mahama's tenure, yeah. this is exactly what the opposition was saying. Okay. That President Mahama and his ministers, including you, mm -hmm. should be apologizing to the people of Ghana mm -hmm. for bringing about doom so. Okay. And all the conditions that had led us to the IMF at the time and the hardships that Ghanaians were facing. Okay. Of course, at that time, we hadn't experienced what we're experiencing today. Mm -hmm. So at the time, mm -hmm. they were calling mm -hmm. for penitence mm -hmm. from you. Mm -hmm. They didn't get it. I see. I disagree. 
I disagree because you know, um, Empress Mahama was by no means perfect. I mean, I wouldn't say that we were infallible. But, be, but, but let's take it. Let's take the issues one after the other. Let's take, for example, Doomsaw. The fact of the matter, Doomsaw was never caused by the NDC. Doomsaw, as you know, would have happened during Ronnie's time, happened during Kufour's time, and started during Prof. Mill's time. So it is something that happened, it's cyclical. What made it worse during President Mahama's time is that it was happening at the time that it was not just the water that was at the lowest level. And therefore, Akosombo hardly could give us anything. It was also happening with the same time with the breakdown in the, what you call the pipeline that was coming from Nigeria. And so it was literally forced Montreal. But what did Mahama, what did President Mahama do? He actually was not even, uh, he didn't even try to even blame somebody for doing so. He didn't go about blaming NPP for not investing enough in the eight years of prison. Before he didn't do that. He just took responsibility and said, you know what, I'll fix it. And exactly that's what he did. He focused on it and showed that the job got done. When the issue happened about the economic difficulty, why? He was humble enough to call for an economic forum. He invited even the, the, the opposition. He invited everybody. That's what humility in office does. That's not, the, that's not the act of an arrogant person. As opposed to what we have seen from our friends, when in the middle of this crisis, they still were being so boastful, so arrogant, made declarations that, listen, we will never go to the IMF. We are capable of managing the affairs of Ghana. We are a proud nation. I mean, that is simply the mark of, of, of a group of people who actually believe that they are, they are what you call, um, it's like the gift of God to Ghana. So it's a complete, completely different situation between Mahama or the NDC and our friends in power. I have to say, I mean, in spite of everything you've said so yeah. far, I'm yet to hear any alternatives yeah. to what we heard from the finance minister okay. in parliament. Okay. I mean, if, if, if the NDC were in office, mm -hmm. what would your plans have been for 2024? How okay. would you be planning to turn things around for Ghanaians mm -hmm. uh, to make Inkunim a truthful tag mm -hmm. for the budget? Mm -hmm. You know, the issue about the alternatives, I mean, it's, it's very legitimate um, uh, uh, request. Uh, and you clearly also know that even though we haven't really reached the stage where we are prepared to pull down what you call a comprehensive body of uh, proposals in place, one thing you can be sure is when you take over an economy and you supervise that economy into a state of collapse, the first thing you need to appreciate is that, listen, you met economy at a certain level. The least you could do was to have maintained that. Now, what were the levels that they made this economy? You made, for example, cocoa production at the end of 2016. It was, what, 960,000 metric tons. That's almost 1 million metric tons. The second highest in the recent history of the, of, of the country. The first was 2011, when we were about 1 million metric tons. In 2016, we got 960,000 metric tons. I mean, that's massive. You can, you can, that's an, we're talking about alternative, that's a good alternative. You want to make sure you at least restore us to the place where cocoa production is a solid. You will make a balance of payment, I mean, surplus. At the time we took over in 2008, it was a massive deficit we met. We handed you a balance of payment surplus. Alternative, that's a good alternative. Make sure you come back to at least that minimum. You know, you met what you call gross international reserves of $6.2 billion. The least you can do is to at least ensure that that remains. Now, so alternatives are good, and we'll definitely have that conversation. But the least you can do is to at least preserve what you have met, not to have destroyed the economy further. We're talking to Fifi Kwiti, and we've heard what he thinks about the budget that was read earlier uh, last week. But here's what we're going to do when we come back. First of all, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the upcoming race. John Mahama will be squaring off against uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia and any other takers. Uh, we'll see exactly how the NDC uh, in opposition is gearing up for that race. But also, you must have seen that video making the rounds. Someone has revived it from the past. Pipi saying some very interesting things about the chances of Dr. Baumia ever becoming MPP flag bearer. We'll hear from his own mouth how he sees those words today. Stay with us, we'll be back after these.
You're welcome back. This is a special edition, and we're having a conversation with Fifi Kwete, of course, the General Secretary of the nation's biggest opposition party, the NDC. So far, we've talked about the budget and the economy, the economy. Um, mm -hmm. but I can't have a conversation with you without bringing up <laughs> what seems to be making the rounds recently. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't recall the year, but I think it was during one of your setting the record straight mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. You made some very interesting comments. Mm -hmm. In fact, you said that if Dr. Baumia mm -hmm. was expecting mm -hmm. that assuming they were to win power, mm -hmm. he would then be next in line. Mm -hmm. And he would then be made flag bearer of the NPP mm -hmm then he wasn't in touch with reality. Mm -hmm. In fact, you suggested it is something that would never happen. Mm -hmm. He's the flag bearer. Mm -hmm. uh, are you regretting your words? No, not at all. I mean, congratulations to him uh, for emerging as the flag bearer of the, of the NPP. Uh, we say that uh, we in the NDC welcome it because uh, uh, we are not being complacent but uh, we are totally sure that we are facing um, a damaged candidate. A candidate that has been exposed for who he is. Uh, a candidate who uh, made all kinds of pretenses, uh, created the impression that he was some kind of economic messiah. Uh, but the reality today that he's been, as the Bible would call, he's been found wanting. He's been weighed in the balances and found wanting completely. Worse than that, uh, not just that he's, um, he's been exposed uh, for just being, shall I call it, blabbermouth, somebody who basically talks a lot but does very little. He's also been shown to be somebody who cannot be trusted, uh, somebody who cannot, who has gone very low levels of credibility. Now, so, uh, work, meeting him uh, into, in the 2024 is actually we welcome. Now, am I surprised that he emerged as a candidate of the, of the NPP? I would say no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not really surprised because uh, the person who obviously would have, um, let's say this one, the person who actually would have been the one to take over from Nana Kufuado from the readings, and if you understand the MPP's working configuration very well, was supposed to be Alan Shumate. Uh It moved from Kufu to Nana Kufuado. Uh, Nana Kufuado contested Kufu then, uh, and then Akufuado took over from Kufu. Uh, Lanche Martin contested Akufuado. It was pretty obvious uh, from the reading at the time we were reading that the next person in line was going to be Alan Shumate, knowing the tradition of the MPP as we did. Uh, so what we said at the time was something that we believe was the case. And uh, we still believe that if Alan Tremonti had remained in the race, possibly it could, not, it could have been a different ball game. But as it were, uh, he pulled out. And naturally, once he pulls out, he gives some kind of advantage uh, to Dr. Baumia. And, uh, but even so, you can see even the struggle that he had against an, a candidate who, as at a year ago, did not even have in mind to run for, for the presidency, against, um, let's call it, um, and he's my very good friend, uh, uh, Ken, Ken, uh, uh, Ken Ajapon, but uh, to be honest with you, um, he's not what you call uh, uh, somebody that, in the scheme of things, should be giving Baumia a, a tough run. But either way, money to still give him such a tough run. Either way, yeah. you were proved categorically wrong. I mean, yeah. you accused your political opponents mm -hmm. of being uh, not only ethnocentric but mm -hmm. uh, religious bigots, that mm -hmm. they would never choose mm -hmm. a Muslim mm -hmm. as a flag bearer. They've done exactly that. Okay, let's see yeah. this way. You know, you can sometimes um, try very hard to prove your opponent wrong. And in the process, it almost amounts to cutting your nose to spite your face. MPP has done that. This is not the first time. MPP um, effort to, for example, push through all these 1D1Fs that they spoke about a lot from 2017. 
It's largely because we had called them out again and again and said, you were just lying to the people of Ghana. You do not even have the resources to be able to get this done. The kind of things you are putting out, you are simply doing need for political purposes to deceive people for votes. Naturally, having accused them, what they want to do is to say, no, we are going to go all out to prove them wrong. Not so much because they believe in it, but they want to simply prove their opponent wrong, which is fine. At the end of the day, what matters is the manner in which you are able to really do it. It's something you're not really committed to. When you do it, you do it badly. And that, for example, is what we have seen, for example, in the implementation of the free SHS, which also was one of the things we call it. They say, you're lying to the people of Ghana. You do not have what it takes to be able to do this in a format in which you claim you want to do it. Down the years, every single person who follows, for example, what's going on with the free SHS know that what we said has come true. Because everyone knows, for example, that there is the need for a serious review because the implementation, the way it's going, will literally amount to just destroying education and causing harm to the future of our children. So there are instances where, as in politics, you want to prove your opponent wrong, not because necessarily you believe in something. I need to prove them wrong. They've put a tag on me that I'm an Akan party. I've constantly looked down upon the people from the North. I do not respect them. So you know what? I'm going to do something to prove them wrong. What makes you that's even okay. say In that? Because, it does happen. I mean, they've had running mates mm -hmm. from the northern part of the yeah. country. They have a whole one third of their tradition, mm -hmm. which is from the northern part mm -hmm. of the country. So what exactly is it that leads you and others? Mm -hmm. Let's be fair. You're not the only one who has this view. Mm -hmm. What is it that leads you and others mm -hmm. to tag them so firmly mm -hmm. as anti-northern? You know, uh, if you observe our, our friends very carefully, you know clearly well that uh, they are, they've constantly picked northern candidates, or even if you call it Muslim candidate, not so much on the back. I would say that really until, until possibly the choice of Baumia. The choice of, of Ali Muhammad. Listen. They didn't pick Ali Muhammad because of some kind of political stalwart. No. If they're looking for political stalwart, they were political stalwart in the north that they could have picked, who were known politically, who got what you call solid pedigree. Like, for example, when we chose uh, Mohamed Mumoni for running mate in 2004, that was a political stalwart we were picking. We're not picking somebody on the back of the fact that he's come from the northern region or he's a Muslim. No. Because when you hear Muhammad Mumoni, the first thing that comes to mind is that this is a solid political heavyweight. Has got name recognition. Has contributed politically in the country and known in parliament and, and, and outside of parliament. Now, when you go and pick Aliyu Mahama, who even within the party was barely known, it's pretty obvious what the game plan is. And we saw it coming. And that's what we were able to predict, for example, that there was no way he was even going to make a dent when they went for their, for their primaries in, was it 2000, was in a, which year was that, uh, 2006 or so. We knew he was going nowhere. Why? Because he was not picked because he was a, a Star Wars. He was picked purely for purposes of what you call tokenism. But clearly, tokenism so that we can say, you know what, people of the North, and our Muslim brothers, we've been able to pick one of you. That comes from a condescending attitude. As opposed to us, when, for example, we pick a John Mahama, we're not picking a John Mahama because he's an ordinar. We are picking a political heavyweight who also happened to be an ordinar. When we pick Muhammad Mumuni, we are not picking him because he's a Muslim or a ordinar. We are picking somebody who already is established politically before secondary. Or let's call it the icing of the cake happen to be where it comes from or what religion it practices. That's Our friends, because traditionally, have always been known as very heavy, heavily, shall I, shall I call it, uh, moved towards one particular side of the country. That was haunting them. There are some who would argue that yeah. you've done the same thing. I mean, John Mahama picked Professor Nana Jinu Pukwajiman mm -hmm. as running mate. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't. That's a, that was a minister 
of states. Yes. And no mean, no mean a position. Mm. Minister for Education. Dr. Bamiya that was, was vice that was, president. No, 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 just one. I just, I, you know, I'm trying to build the case. You're telling me about what, what statement that had been made previously. And I'm, I'm trying to explain to you that in the choices in the past, especially out to Aliyu Mahama, but purely for token purposes. They pick somebody from the north, also additionally a Muslim, so, so that they will be able to use it to tell the northern brothers and our Muslim brothers that, you know, we pick one of you. So, you, so you could clearly know. For Poko Ajima was for tokenism purposes. No. Yeah, you, the, the fact that she was a woman, the Prof, in, Prof happened to be from the central region. Prof happened to be an accomplished academic, a vice chancellor of a top university of the country who moved into politics and was a very successful minister for education. So by every means, we are talking about somebody who already has established herself. On, then the icing on the cake happened to come from Central Region, happened to be a woman. So the consideration, you must have what it takes first in order to be able to also command your own support base. Then in addition, other things happen. I mean, regionalism is not a problem. All over the world, the issue about regionalism happened. And our own constitution allows for regionalism. It said there must be what a regional balance as much as possible. So there's no problem with regionalism. One thing which is clear mm. is that at some point, mm. your party realized that that expectation was wrong. Because for some time now, mm. almost every comment that comes from your party's mm -hmm. communicators, mm -hmm. especially since you became general secretary mm -hmm. at least. We always hear you say the Akufuado Baumia government. Mm -hmm. We always hear you refer mm -hmm. to uh, the vice president. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear, we hear you say Al Haji, mm -hmm. Dr. Baumia. Mm -hmm. We see these deliberate use of, first of all, his name whenever you mention the president's mm -hmm. name. We hear you refer to him as Al Haji Baumia. Mm -hmm. And of all of your comments mm -hmm. about how things will go mm -hmm. in 2024 mm -hmm. are with the assumption that you'll be going up against him. Mm -hmm. So that must mean that at some point before he won the primaries for his party mm -hmm. to become flag bearer, mm -hmm. your party realized that it was going to be him. Yeah, I mean, in politics, you always have to um, uh, be prepared for any eventuality. After all, as I said earlier, as opposed to, for example, uh, Alaji Aliu Mahamada, it was pretty clear that uh, in, the, in the scheme of things, it was definitely not going to emerge. Why? Because, as I said, uh, he was not exactly picked because he had any pedigree. He was picked simply to satisfy uh, an ethnic and religious, religious, uh, shall I call it, uh, shall I call it uh, token, that really is what it was. And exactly what it is that we expected that it was going to be dumped, and he was truly dumped. The Baumian's choice was largely because Anakopo claimed he was an economic wizard. Claimed he was an economic wizard. And of course, I mean, when they came into office, I mean, initially on the back of the solid uh, uh, things they inherited, I mean, they started pretty well. But by 2019, things started to unravel. Sometimes they make it look as if it is because of COVID, but the truth is that if you check even 2019, you could see, for example, the depreciation in Sydney has started already, I mean, uh, uh, badly performing. Uh, deficits, I mean, the, five, I mean what you know, the, the, the budget deficit has already gone very high already. So problems started okay already. So we clearly su suspected that given how it's be, it is, it's likely that Baumia could win. That you need to, to make preparation for. But of course, the Alan Fatah, as I explained earlier, was there. And knowing exactly the nature of the NPP, that is a factor you couldn't discount. Mm -hmm. I suspect that possibly one of the things that maybe went against Alan is the fact that he stayed too long in, this, in, the, in, the, in a, what you call a sinking ship. If he had been smart enough to get out of that ship very early, he, could, he obviously could have distanced himself from the mess that we have today. But having stayed that long, it made it pretty difficult for him so to be able to, as it were, show that he's not part of the mess that we see today. So I guess that really affected him. But whatever it is, in politics, you need to prepare. You prepare for eventuality. If it's Alan, we are ready. If it was Baumia, we are ready. The reason why we had to call Baumia is because he was the one in charge of the economic uh, management team. He was the vice president. 
So if there was an economic problem, we needed to make sure the country knew that both Nanakufuado and Baumia were in charge. So there was really no, no problem. But the bit on the the bit on the, the religious dimension of it, and that is one that I think we need to because you see, after the emergence of Baumia, you could see all these many efforts that are being made to create a whole scenario of as if Ghana were some kind of uh, were in some kind of uh, uh, religious war in our country between Christians and Muslims. They've come up with stories like, oh, Fifi Kweti actually said that no Muslim can ever become the president of the country. No, let me tell you. What we were talking about, and that statement was made way back in 2007, ahead of the contest of the NPP that had to do with Aliyu Mahama. And I actually was making an analysis of that contest. And see, Aliyu Mahama was purely picked for religious tokenism. tokenism. That's all it was. Not because he had any pedigree. And he was going to be dumped. I said that. Ah. And I said, that, listen, if you pick anyone on the back of religious tokenism, you make it difficult for the person to emerge. Why? Because if it's simply about religion, then the majority Christians will be voting against you if you stood as a Muslim. But if you stood because you have polit political pedigree, then you are winning not because of religion, but you are winning because you have what it takes. That was the point. So the issue is about condemning religious tokenism. But it appears as if even in this emergence of Baumia, our friends in MPP are gradually trying to again stoke up the same religious tokenism. So now picture him as a religious person. But listen, we are not choosing a, an imam to be a president of Ghana. It's interesting to hear you say that yeah. because they would argue that they are, they are, they are flag bearer, their candidate, mm -hmm. is trying to be a uniting force. He constantly refers to his own upbringing as a child, mm -hmm. you know, before he became a Muslim, mm -hmm. uh, that he was a Christian, he had a Christian name. Mm -hmm. He goes to church, he preaches in churches, mm -hmm. he, you know, he knows Christian prayers, mm -hmm. he, he demonstrates a certain affiliation mm -hmm. to Christians, mm -hmm. all in a bid to demonstrate that as a flag bearer, mm -hmm. he can be representative of both of these major mm -hmm. religious groups. Mm -hmm. So. Are you sure that they are the ones bringing division mm -hmm. on the lines of religion? Or is it not, you know, people who perhaps share your view? No, if, for example, you go and go and make an appeal to your, your listen, Muslim brothers, that they should vote for you because you are a Muslim. They should vote for you because you are a Muslim. What are you doing? I don't go to, I won't go to a church and say, vote for me because I'm a Christian. No. But you vote for me, to the vote vote for and say vote for me because I'm Ewe. If we, I would tell voter people vote for me or because I'm Ewe. No, or you vote. Or team, I go there to are so, no, but there are so many Ewe's who have stood and lost. So you cannot just go and say vote for me because I'm an Ewe. Vote for me fundamentally because I have what it takes to be a leader. I've got integrity. I've got good ideas. I love the country. I'm a patriot. I will do what is right. I'm disciplined. Give the attribute. And then, in addition, I also happen to come from your area. So it should always be about the reason why you are a leader first. But if all you think about number one is that, oh, I happen to belong to your sect, that's why you are voting for me, then why not? Let's rather go and choose an imam. Where should we choose you? Well, let's look for, if it's a Christian, let's choose a prophet or a pastor. But that's not what we are looking for. We are looking for somebody who can be trusted. You cannot be trusted, Baumia. You have no credibility. So mentioning that you are a Muslim or a Christian matters not. Because what matters is the quality of who you are. And you are proven to be somebody who has no credibility, somebody who absolutely lies. Why on earth would anybody want to take you seriously? In the 30 seconds before we take our next break, let me ask you this. Mm. You're a political strategist. Would you have had a tougher time as a party winning the next election if Kennedy and Japan had been chosen as flag bearer for the MPP? Uh, to be honest with you, uh, Kenyan Japan clearly would have been able to say, you know, I was not the reason why this whole mess has happened. And that could be an appeal because there is clear anger about the level of um, destruction that's happened to the economy, the suffering that is taking place. So he would have been able to do that. So naturally, he clearly could have been more difficult. Why? Because he's not so directly in the line of the supervision of the problem. So naturally, he could be able to have an advantage. 
But this one, every step of the way, is deep neck in the problem. So there's no way you can run away. And, so and, you would and, have had and a tough time defeating Kennedy. Again. Oh, I would just have said that he would have been a little more difficult to be able to pin the problems on. So naturally, that gives him room to be able to say, no, it's not me, therefore, vote for me. All right. Well, as to exactly what will happen, that is difficult to... Well, that's the next uh, leg of our conversation mm -hmm. with Fifi Kwete. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk about election 2024. For most people, it's going to be Mahama versus Baumia. How does that unfold for the General Secretary of the NDC? We'll find out after this. Welcome back. And we're talking to Fifi Kwete, the General Secretary of the NDC. And, oh boy, it's been a fascinating conversation so far. Uh, Mr. Kwete, let's, let's talk about election 2024 the big uh, the big battle mm -hmm. so well the lines are drawn it looks like the NPP has chosen Dr. Baumia mm -hmm. uh, the NDC has chosen uh, um, John, uh, John Mahama, Mahama. Mm -hmm. now, of course now the only variables remaining will be running mates mm -hmm. so we know how it works mm -hmm. you want to pick a running mate who will appeal mm -hmm. to a large constituency of mm -hmm. people so Strategically, mm -hmm. how I know that in the end the decision will be made by your um, your flag bearer. Sure. But that's why you are there, you know, with your strategic experience. Mm -hmm. You will be advising him and directing uh, him on how to make this decision. Mm -hmm. So, which constituencies do you want to appeal to mm -hmm. in order to put yourself in a better position than your opponents in mm -hmm. 2024? Uh, generally, um, you want to win as many constituencies as possible. I'm not talking here about political constituencies. I'm talking more about demographics. Yes, yes. So, for example, you want to win as many young people as possible because you can't win an election in Ghana unless you get a lot of the young people with you. You want to win as many women as possible because once you have the women on your side, trust me, you are, you are, you are, you are home. Mm. So you want to make sure you're appealing to women. And naturally, you're appealing to women, you're appealing to the family. Mm. So that is always going to be the calculation. You want to to make sure that um, across all regions you are competitive. Mm -hmm. But of course, some regions that are much more strategic. So right. for instance, I mean, if you know, the, when we had the original 10, 10 regions of Ghana, mm -hmm. uh, we had four regions that were considered to be swing regions. And those regions will always remain so. And those original regions will be Greater Accra, Central Region, Western Region, meaning now Western and Western North, the Western Region, and Bronga Afro. Those were the four regions that were known as swing regions. And they continue to be what they are. So you want to make sure as much as possible you are competitive in those regions. Mm. Greater Accra is quite important because I mean, the numbers are there as well. And you need to do whatever you can. Central region, uh, you, can, you are not winning an election unless you have central region in the bag. You have western region as much of that in the bag as well. You are doing very well in Brown Garfield. So clearly, uh, those will be areas we are going to work. You also want to ensure that you are turning out your vote in your strongholds, meaning the places where naturally you are strong, you are getting the turnout to be massive. Mm. In fact, talking about turnout, you want to make sure there is as much turnout as possible. Because in opposition, the bigger the turnout, the better. Yeah. We're in government, because of clear anger, disenchantment, disappointment, you often wish there's no tenor because when people yeah. are turning out in numbers, it means that you are on your way home. So sure. in opposition, our job is to make sure that turnout is massive. People come out. They come out in their numbers to want to vote. You want to ensure you do whatever you can to hold down your opponent capacity to do what he, what he can do in the strongholds. Yeah. So Ashanti region, Eastern region, that traditionally have been the strongholds of your opponent. You want to make sure you try hard. You may not be able to win. You may not be able to uh, make massive impact, but at least you want to hold. It's like coming to, uh, uh, let's say, I'm Chelsea to, let's say, Man City away. You want to make sure you limit the extent of the damage, mm -hmm. hoping that you can bring him home and then win finally. Yeah. So effectively, that's what it does. Mm -hmm. So the choices running men are going to factor all that into, into consideration. The so, capacity to, to first and foremost, represent the vehicle properly. Mm -hmm. Have the proper, shall I call it, uh, uh, um, chemistry mm -hmm. with, with, with the flat better. Because that's very important ca ca calculation. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, individual who does not, you know, some, some running men sometimes tend to think that they actually should have more important than flat better. Mm -hmm. No, you are, you are a running man. Exactly. Yeah. Play your position well. Do your job well. But beyond all that, the party is always the number one. The vehicle is always the party. 
uh, sometimes we tend to overplay uh, the individuals mm -hmm. much more than we play the vehicle. The vehicle is always number one. You always want to make sure that NDC continues to position itself as a solid vehicle. And so the track record of that party, down from J.D. Rawlings through Prof. Mills, through John Mahama, that history has to be stated. The people of Ghana need to know that in terms of the development of this country, this vehicle has been very reliable. The resources that have been available to us and what we have delivered, even given those resources, MPP cannot measure by any means. This vehicle has also been very trustworthy. I mean, so these are things that we are going to uh, bring onto the table. So we will go for, we'll go for everything. We'll do everything we can. Yeah. Putting together all the factors you've mentioned, I'm, I, I seem to be painting a picture in my head of a, a youth-oriented person, hopefully from one of the swing states or affiliated mm -hmm. to one of the swing states, uh, swing uh, regions. Uh, somebody who might be a woman. Why not? Nothing uh, is off the table. Uh, yes, because that was the second constituency or demographic yeah. you mentioned. And uh, somebody who you believe can play their position yeah. as a supporter. That points to very few people. <laughs> I know. I know you're trying very hard to. <laughs> that moment to come. I know that if I am, that coming, moment to, if I am coming to this realization, <laughs> then you came to it a long time ago. So walk us through the thought process. Uh, you know, what are some of the interesting names that have been thrown up? I think really, it'd be early. And again, don't forget, we always want to make sure as a party we, we go through the processes properly. And don't forget, we also have a history. And sometimes we tend to forget. But uh, we never, for example, even come close to the choice of a running mate in the year before an election. Never. In fact, I think uh, when, uh, when Vice, then a uh, running mate John Mahama was, was named, I think that was almost in August of 2008, four months to an election. Mm. Uh, when, uh, um, uh, what's the name? Prof. Nana Jane was named. I think that was in July again, so about five months to an election. So the history already shows that it's not something that is done even too early because there are so many other processes that we need to, 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 to put in place. Yeah. We've done the election of the flat bearer together with the parliamentary candidate. We've just almost recently finished the outstanding, outstanding uh, parliamentary candidate, and it's just for a couple of them that are left. Mm -hmm. We have processes to go through at the regional level. We started a national tour, I mean, of the flag bearer to be able to basically like uh, uh, find out exactly. So all that is part of the conversation that will lead to that, that eventual one. So I would say we still have time. Okay. Let's, not, so, let's, not, let's not be in a hurry. So I get it that you, 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 you would rather not give me names. So let me ask a, mm -hmm. perhaps an easier to answer okay. question. All right. You can't tell me who is in the in line okay. or who is being considered mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you can at least tell me mm -hmm. whether prof jane Okukwajiman should be replaced from a strategic point of view no i mean it's still if, if i answer that then i'm indirectly answering the question that you're Not asking really because there are still a <laughs> number of people because that see, might be if you do admit that and i've spoken about her earlier that she was somebody who was chosen because she's got pedigree who already had established herself in academia, who became a minister, got herself established, who actually was running mate. And as far as we are concerned, uh, the job she did as a running mate together with the Flamera, uh, they told them performed very well. Uh, I would say that uh, if you check exactly the results of uh, 2020, even though we did not win, it was pretty clear that uh, we get more women votes, for example, or more central region votes or more votes from the uh, intellectual class? Let's say, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the seats we had in Central Region, uh, I think as uh, 2016, when we did the election, we came down to about three seats in Central Region. As we speak today, we have majority of seats from that region. That's true. So that, that itself shows already that uh, a lot of good work has been done. And well, we believe a lot more can be done. done. Yeah, but parliament is always key. I mean, you can imagine, for example, but for but for the but for but for the but for the what happened that led to this current 187, 187. Mm. If things were no uh, some amount of the shenanigans that took place, we should have had a clear majority in parliament, and that could have been a whole different ballgame as far as the country is concerned. But today. you think the 
long-running NATO contributor to that? The, thing, the truth is, you see, in politics, it's sometimes a bit unfair. Supposing we had three seats in parliament, and somehow at the end of that election, it came down to one seat, would the Rani may not be blamed? That you came from the region, yet the performance was so bad. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were able to get more seats in parliament, someone the Rani may should not take the credit. Clearly, the Rani may take the credit for what is plus. It's to simply, minus. you know, uh, look at your presidential votes. How, they, how you did in the presidential race. Even if you look at the presidential region. numbers, you could clearly see that there was a, an appreciation of vote across the country. So you would say that she yeah, actually so brought in more? Naturally. naturally. There was so a clear should she be kept? That decision will be taken by the flat better in consultation with the party leadership. So as I said earlier, I would wait for that time. So I, don't be, think, I, don't think should, I don't think we should be in a hurry. to keep her. Would it be well? Good political strategy to keep her. As well as when the moment comes, I'm sure we'll be able to look at all the, all the angles and be able to make a decision. Whatever decision we'll make will be one that we believe will be in the supreme interest of the, of the party and also of the nation. So uh, I'm sure when that moment comes, we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll definitely make that decision with the flat better leading. Yes. What about an Ashanti running mate? That, the, the Ashanti region is your opponent's stronghold, mm -hmm. but in the last election, mm -hmm. You actually made some inroads. Okay, inroads in terms of parliamentary, we mean, or uh, presidential? Which um, actually, I'm thinking presidential. Okay. So, is that something you're thinking about? Do you think perhaps? I think I think all options remain on the table. The only the only place that, for a fact, you know, there could be no option coming from would be the original northern region, where the flabera comes from. So indirectly, you cannot be picking anybody from that original region where you come from. That. Every other region, there is a possibility. Doesn't that feed a little bit into your own, you know, regional tokenism in what theory? Way? In what way? You would have, uh, you have thought that you would not exclude a northern regional... No, but don't forget, the constitution it speaks about regional balance. In Remember, the constitution of Ghana speaks for regional balance. Even not in just in political the nomi not just, Basically, in all things that we presidential do. For example, in the choices you make, uh, for example, a ministerial appointment that you make, yeah. even at the level of the party, you look at regional balance. It's, it's just in America, you pick somebody from the north, he picks, he picks uh, what do you name, a running mate from the south. It's, it's, it's nothing, nothing uh, strange. Mm -hmm. So that regional calculation would always come into the picture. It's different from this religious tokenism that our friends are trying so hard to stock. Mm -hmm. I'm a Muslim, therefore you must choose me. We don't want a leader because you are Christian or Muslim. We want a leader because you have what it takes, and that should be number one consideration. Mm -hmm. Let every other thing be secondary. Your number one consideration is are you reliable? Can you be trusted? Do you have credibility? Mm -hmm. Do you tell the truth? Do you work hard? Do you love the country? Are you competent? Those are the considerations that we should be looking at. And then after that, every other thing becomes a nice scene on the cake. And that is the point the NEC makes. That's what we have constantly done. And every choice that we've made from 1992 to today has been made purely on the back of that consideration, first and foremost, that we are putting forward a candidate that stands tall on his own first before we look at any other consideration. Now, your job is to pretty much run your political party on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, it's that sort of CEO role, if you will, as general secretary. Um, your opposite number, Justin mm -hmm. Kodia, recently um, <laughs> issued a statement mm -hmm. that some five members, senior members of it, their party, mm -hmm. have in effect sacked themselves. Okay. Um, I think uh, Nano Hinito, mm -hmm. um, uh, Yawabin, uh, okay. Samoa, mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, Hoopsila Doye, okay. and two others. Okay. Because they have expressed support for Alan Chamantin, who is now seeking to run as an independent okay. presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. Would your party, would you have handled this situation the same way? Um, I mean, I don't exactly know exactly their constitution. I don't know what exactly their constitution is. But if it is that truly, that is what their constitution says, and they implement them, you cannot, you, cannot, you cannot blame them. They're just applying their constitution. But of course, in politics, before you come to that, you want to have a conversation in order to know exactly the readiness of the individuals, exactly what are you willing to do. Because in politics, you can support a candidate up to a point, like it happened in the NDC. When, for example, at the time, uh, Mrs. Rollins uh, stood against Prof Mills, 
before it 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 morphed into into full blown situation. You have what you call Funka, which are the group that we're supporting. But when eventually Mrs. Ron decided to move to a new party, uh, the NDP, a lot of the Funka people did not go. But those who decided to go, but that is actually a party formation. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case of Alan, Alan hasn't gone to form a party. He basically says he's having a movement. He's an independent candidate. Now, the question then is, this, I mean, if you are supporting him and you are still a member of the NDC, uh, of the MPP, uh, how does that work? I mean, so naturally, you expect that if you are still a member of the NDC, then you are of the MPP. I keep calling NDC because <laughs> NDC, NDC, NDC is, a, is a top alternative in the country. So naturally, <laughs> naturally, I call it NDC. Now, so if you're a member of the MPP and you are supporting another person against the candidate that your party has chosen, then it becomes an issue of conflict. To be honest with you, I would have been expecting those individuals, if that truly is what it is they felt, they themselves should have effectively just walk away and say, listen, where we are at the moment, we are totally committed to Alan. So temporarily, we are off the party. And uh, eventually, after the Alan thing, whatever happens, we can think otherwise. I thought that would have been a resolution. So what would I have done? We would have had that conversation first. Right. But of course, if the people are adamant that we want to, you cannot eat your cake and have it, can you? So you cannot, you cannot be supporting one candidate who are belonging to another party. So that, that is something I cannot. I allow them room to do what they've got to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for spending your time with us. And it's thank great. you for joining us. For thank you very session. much. And, uh, thank and thanks for staying with us here on the Joy News channel. This is The Pulse. And guess what? Starting Sunday, the sixth uh, edition of the Volta Fair will get underway uh, in Grand Style. It will be under the theme uh, leveraging the African continental free trade area for economic development. Well, uh, they've lined up you know, celebrities of the land to help attract patronage uh, from across the country uh, and beyond to also uh, seek some more attendance uh, of, uh, you know, the likes of uh, the Yagbu Mafia of Asogli State, Obia Feda himself, the 14th, who will be there, the regional minister, Dr. Archibald Lecha, who's uh, using, uh, you know, their good offices and influence to uh, try and attract more investment uh, into the Volta region. Well, in studio with us now is Fred Avonio, a former uh, business uh, editor here at Joint News, and he's also uh, a son of the land as well. So many names, uh, and I need to point out that I'm a product myself. Uh, so it's good to be talking to Fred. Uh, you can see Volta Fair 2023. That's what we're talking about. But for many who are not aware of why we need to talk Volta, uh, let's talk about the previous years and the kind of experience that we had. Very well. So, Volta region is one beautiful part of Ghana. Yeah, right? it, I agree. Part, I, I mean, no doubt. <laughs> yes. um, it's one beautiful part of Ghana mm -hmm. that has not been explored sufficiently. Mm. People here about the region, they have no idea how it looks like, how it feels like. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we realize that, look, the investment potential is huge across all sectors, be it agriculture, tourism, education, and all of that. So, it was decided that, look, there's a need to project the potential of the region for the rest of the world to know so that we can attract the right set of investment, mm -hmm. develop the whole area, and increase the national economy. Because whatever happens to that part of the country yeah. affects the entire um, country. So that was the reason that led, that birthed the, the, whole idea. the whole idea. And that's why I was talking about it, that this is not the first of, it, of its no. kind. Uh, we've done this for how many years now? This is actually going to be the sixth mm -hmm. edition. Mm -hmm. uh, but from 2019, yeah. uh, that's why we, we saw a lot of stability and we saw a lot of uh, patronage. And it's been going up from that time. So 2019 was good. Mm -hmm. 2021, which was the last edition, was yeah. superb. We do it every other year. Wow. Okay, so it was fantastic two years ago. And this year, it promises to be even bigger. Greater. Uh, and the sharp focus on the uh, African continental free trade area is that interesting bit for me. One would say, well, this is the Volta region, just a part or a fraction of Ghana. Why should these people be concerned about the free trade area? Well, I think regional trade is the way now. Mm -hmm. And that's how come Ghana is playing host to the Secretariat. Right. And so we cannot be left out. We are thinking of increasing trade within ourselves as a continent. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to have a fair, we cannot just look within Ghana. Yeah. We definitely must be along, yes, what the continent is thinking of. And beyond, be, besides that, when we had the last fair, 2021, 
there were interests expressed by other African countries, thanks to the power of social media. Oh. They got to know what was happening. Just to be a part of it. They the wanted fair. to be a part of it. So we had that initial um, interest, and then we opened it up. And so we have exhibitors coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo, okay. from Namibia, from Kenya, Nigeria, Togo, Benin, and other African countries coming in. And that's how come this year it is themed on after. Wow. So Volta going global, I guess. Exactly. I guess that's what we're exactly. doing. Uh, but what does the region have to offer? Uh, I guess that's the question on, on the table now. A lot. Mm. Now, so we have, now, so everybody will tell anybody who knows Volta region. And actually, it, it's been quite, that's a phrase that Volta region is a microcosm of Ghana. Right. In that, whatever you find in any part of Ghana, you, you will find, find in the Volta, Volta region. region. And that's how we say that when you visit Volta, you experience Ghana. We have water bodies of different, we have the sea, and the sea provides economic activity. We have the water river, we have the water lake, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of fish farming potential that we have there. And the historical significance the also histo is Of course, it's also there. Yes. Then we have the arable land. Look, rice farming in the Volta region, yeah. I mean, the rice is the best. I mean, there's still more land that can be cultivated for rice. We have shallows, we have vegetables of all kinds, and then we have the cash crops. There is cocoa in the water region. There is coffee. Which in the many water do region. not know about. Exactly. There mm. is coconut. The, all of that happening in the water region. In fact, some of the best coffees are made from the water region. There's the Kamaoka, there is the Avitutui. They are from the water region. There is cotton. Mm. So the land is there for us to cultivate three crops, cultivate uh, food stuff that we need and all of that. And then there's enough land for us to do manufacturing as well. Uh, some of the manufacturing companies have started relocating to the place. There's wine made in the Volta yeah. region. Mm -hmm. and, and then real estate is also coming up. There's a golf course in the Volta region now. Oh, wow. Yes. And a lot of beautiful resources are coming up by the waterfront, both the riverside and then the seaside. Okay, uh, if, if it would take um, maybe someone to discover what, what's happening, this is why the Volta Fair, I, I believe, is being organized. But it must follow in some series, and I believe you have a, a lineup of, of the events that will, you know, chronicle where you need to start experiencing the region from and how it will end. So what are some of the activities we're to expect in terms of where we're starting off from, the exciting activities, and when, when it will all end? There's actually a lot. It's going to be a two weeks packed festival okay. of business, of networking, mm -hmm. and of tourism and culture and all of mm -hmm. that. So the fair starts from Sunday, the 26th mm -hmm. of this month. Right. That's the, the, when it will start. The actual opening is going to be on the 28th. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of ambassadors, and we have the youngest um, minister from the continent coming. Okay. Yes, from Namibia. She's going to be in attendance. And we have other dignitaries coming for the opening. Now, for the very first time in the entire 66-year history of the Association of Ghana Industries, right. they're going to hold their AGM in the Volta region, oh, National wow. AGM. It's happening as, part part of the as part of the... Yes, Volta. that is on the 29th. Right. It's happening. So the business community throughout the country is going to be in whole. Then we've lined up, apart from the fair itself that is happening every day from the 26th to the 10th of December, we have a number of seminars happening. Now, top of mind, we have the Women Entrepreneurs Summit. You know, we're bringing all the business women that matter to come and share ideas. We have the Youth or the Young Entrepreneurs Summit. We have the Sports Development Summit. Now, we have a workshop in, on horticulture and export opportunities within that space. We're going to have something on climate change as well. Now, this year, the... Uh, Farmers' Day, the regional Farmers' Day will be held in Ho as part of the, the fair. Uh, we're also going to, have, um, we, we're, we're going to have beer festival on okay. two of the weekends. Okay. And this beer festival is not limited to our usual beer that, yeah, we, know, that we know, but the, the indigenous ones. So right. the Solom, the locally uh, brewed Alina, ones. Yeah, those right. ones will be there. Okay. Then there's going to be Kente Festival as well. Okay. Now, Volta Region is, is home of Kente, quality Kente. Now, if you go south, there is um, Agbozume. Yes. That's how come we have the Agbozume Weavers, the name of the football yeah. team. They do a good kente there. If you come to the middle, there's Agotime Pete, wonderful kente. And up north, Tafi, they do kente as well. All these guys will be there to display different designs for us to see. 
So all of that is going to happen. We even have some program for our, our media folks. Okay. So there's going. Oh, to so be the media is not left out at <laughs> all. There's going to be a master class mm -hmm. uh, workshop for mm -hmm. journalists on the African free trade um, area. area, as well as the climate change. So almost everybody is going to benefit from this. Is is going to be a lot of idea sharing, uh, and uh, we also have what we call district days. So each of the 18 districts in the Volta region will have an opportunity to market their district to investors, to business people, to tell them what they have in their district, what are the investment opportunities, what are the businesses, what are the communities doing very well there. So it's a whole package. And taking from what happened with the previous event, we are very hopeful that a lot of businesses will grow as, as a result of this. We got new exporters from the old one. Yeah. People are now exporting to other African countries by participating in the previous event. And we know that new people will also get the opportunity to become exporters after this, particularly because we are going to get a lot of visitors coming from other African countries. This is exciting. Uh, but let's talk about also, you know, cultural events and social engagements that will be happening as part of this. Uh, we don't want the all long and boring talks all, as the youth that's, that's, will describe it. What, what's exciting in terms that's of music, a culture, lot. and you know, now, the So jubilation. during the daytime, yeah. <laughs> the district days are always accompanied by cultural displays. Mm -hmm. so all the traditional drumming and dancing will go on right. during the day. We have the food court, mm -hmm. where there's food and drinks. And that is the most liveliest place <laughs> 24 seven. That's the best place ever. I tried. tell you, that place is, is party time all mm -hmm. through. Right. Then each evening has an entertainment program. So we have musical concerts. Now the beauty of the musical concerts that we have is that we use that as an opportunity to unearth talents. Yeah. So the guys that we don't know, mm -hmm. we give them the platform to perform and get to be known. Yeah. And so each night there's an entertainment run through, through to midnight. And then we're going to have um, a fashion show as well. And then we also want, we will have a Miss Vota Fair also okay. taking place. So every night there's going to be an activity right from Monday through to the last Sunday, the 10th of December. And, and just as I was pointing earlier, some notable um, individuals will be there. Um, Dag Bogumafia, Top Gear Feather, the 14th. Yes. Uh, will be there. Yes. Uh, and then there's the regional minister. There are other celebrities yes, you are expecting as well. Yes, the various uh, paramount chiefs will be there. Okay. Yes. Um, there are different events that they will chair. Okay. And, and on the district days, what happens is that they accompany the DCs to the to, event. To come to the center. So it's yes. a beautiful scene. Right. All dressed up in their full regalia following the, um, the MC or DC to the event. So they're all going to be represented. Then we have the various ambassadors. So the, uh, the uh, American ambassador to Ghana has promised to be there, the, the Dutch amb ambassador. As for the ambassadors from the continent, the Kenyan, the Nigerian, the Togolese, they are always, always there. The, the Namibian, they're all going to be there as right. well. And of course, we're expecting some ministers of states also to be present. Because it's a two-week affair and there are different events, each of these seminars will attract personalities coming in. Um, we're going to have very successful business people also coming in to share their ideas, try to groom the younger ones to take up after them and all of that. So it's going to be business, it's going to be fun, it's going to be networking. It's a whole festival. Mm. And you cannot afford to miss that opportunity. And remember, this yeah. is who, the oxygen city of right. the country. Very peaceful. The, very peaceful. The air there is different. <laughs> the topography alone will make yeah. you feel like, yeah. oh my goodness. And we have planned tours for the two weekends. Mm. We'll do a tour around. We'll go to Amidia Fair. We'll do the canopy walk. Now, that is the best canopy walk you can experience because you're going through the canopy and you see the waterfall, no tea waterfall, you know, dropping on you. Oh, and it's so wow. beautiful. It's such an experience. You don't want to miss it. So let's Indeed. all be in Ho. Well, How about weeks. SMEs? Because I'm, you know, we're talking about continental free trade area. Definitely, businesses should be in mind. Are you giving opportunities uh, for you know these uh, smallholder enterprises to yes. display Very and well. to possibly sell uh, yes. what they have? Yes. Before? So yes, that's place for. So actually, we've categorized the the stand such that. Yeah. Um, even the very small businesses who have the opportunity, right. and they've always been there in their numbers. Um, so the small businesses will be there, the medium and the large, they're all going to be there. And in particular, let me just mention that, that we've always had very good representation from the town area. 
Now, because of this flood situation, they've been badly affected. Yes. But we've yeah. waived the fees for all, all the those coming from that part. Yes. We are working together with the, the various assemblies there, and we've waived the fees for them. So they're all going to come where they have to pay for, 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 for stands, mm. you know, as a contribution. It's a very challenging time. Exactly, for them. exactly. So they're going to be there. And um, it's going to be lovely. Right. All in all, what would be the message to our viewers and uh, those who are outside the region who want to experience Volta? I think it's the right time to just take a break mm -hmm. and come and spend some good two weeks in the Volta region <laughs> yeah. for a change of weather, mm -hmm. beautiful weather, good yeah. food, lovely people, um, business opportunities. I want people to come there and identify business opportunities such that they'll go back again, you know, because they'll have a business interest there. So let's all move there. It started from Sunday, the 26th mm -hmm. of November, all the way to the 10th mm -hmm. of December. And it's happening at the um, whole Jubilee Park. Um, very easy to assess. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And I expect and, to and see you, you there. Yeah, indeed, I should be there. And you know, MFI is going to be there. <laughs> My mother is going to be there. It's the whole team affair. Very wonderful friends. <laughs> Even the point about, and that's what I was going to ask you about, you know, um, accommodation arrangements for people who are not traditionally from the region, uh, you know, staying there for two weeks um, would involve yes. a lot. You, you know, you'd have to do some movement, you'd have to stay somewhere. Do you have that in mind yes. as well? So are there any actually on our website, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh we have a link where you can see the number of hotel Places. facilities, yes, that you can, you can access. And beyond that, we've also spoken to the tertiary institutions. Fortunately for us, some of them will not be in full capacity, in school, doing, right. yes. So we are, their hostels are also available for those who would want to those places. And there are other provisions. We've also spoken to the town folks. Some are willing to share um, rooms, okay. you know, to give them that homely feel as well. Oh, so you can experience like, an, exactly. uh, like a, a family. A family. So all that is there. So, yes, we're encouraging everybody to, to make, make the time to be with us and, and experience um, um, water and enjoy Ghana. And I guess there's going to be a musical concert too. Yes, there's going to be a musical concert, mm -hmm. um, as I said, to unearth the uh, talent. fresh talent. And of course, we have the big players also coming in. Okay. A lot of things we are keeping as secret. We don't want to jump up the place. That'll be a surprise. Yes. <laughs> no, but you know, our brand yeah. ambassador, okay. one of our brand ambassadors mm -hmm. is Adam, right? Oh, so, so Adam is Adam, going to be there. No, I'm not saying he's going to be there. <laughs> I'm not going to take anything out. But I'm just saying we'll that be there. Everyone I'm saying be. it's one of our brand ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And you know the link that he has in the industry. Yeah. If he decides to pull everybody there, it's going to be massive. You but know. it's going to be a great show. We're all passionate about Volta. You need to be at the uh, Volta Fair 2023. Just make your way to the Volta region. Once again, let's remind our viewers of the date. Um, Sunday, Sunday, 27th of November yes. to the 10th of December. Each day, the exhibition is going to be going on. And of course, we'll have the uh, seminars also running alongside so if you go to our website, yeah. you see all the lineup, you get all the information there, you get the numbers to call and um, make sure you're there to enjoy the beauty of hope. And of course, uh, if you want more information, just uh, reach out to Fred or exactly. just come, come over here to join you. Yes. There are lots of us uh, uh, here. Uh, actually, fine, yes, you feel free. Well, and so you can call 244 0244-636097. And whatever information you want, mm -hmm. we are ready to provide that with for you. And uh, I tell you, you will love it in whole. Yeah, I can personally guarantee that. Exactly. So you need to be there, the Volta Fair 2023. Um, lots of fun, uh, business opportunities for you. Just, just be there um, starting the 26th. 26th, yeah. That's Sunday. You need to be there. Lots of us will be there. Mama V will be there. MFA Pa will be there. In fact, uh, we're possibly looking at moving everyone. You from should. The you should. Uh, to also should, be a part yeah. of the, uh, you should, of the you celebration. You do the shows in home. Yeah, so that you experience home for yourself. <laughs> I tell you. Yeah. And we have a very huge following mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Very, very huge. Very, yeah, yeah, very, so, very. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, there's more to come your way, and so you should join us for the Volta Fair. Fred, grateful one more time for Thank joining. Thank you very much. I didn't tell them that you are both. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so that's something we have in common as well. Exactly, that's a so lot. So we are products of the region. You need to uh, just join us. Just join us. You'd love Volta region, uh, and of course, I can personally testify uh, to that. So yes, be at the Volta Fair 2023, and indeed, uh, we'll be happy.
to receive you in the Volta region. Uh, but now let's talk uh, you know, a bit of politics because Majority Leader Osei Mensah Bonsu is refuting claims he's actively campaigning to be selected as running mate to Dr. Mahmoud Obamia ahead of the 2024 elections. The uh, Swami MP uh, says that the NDC MPs as uh, part of their debate uh, on the budget uh, have uh, sought to pitch him against some of his colleagues. Uh, this comes on the back of uh, the minority chief whips, uh, Kwame Gavin Zabuja, who's also from the Volta region, uh, claiming uh, on the floor that uh, Ayasa West will go MP leader Al Hassan did not vote for Dr. Mahmoud Obamia in the NPP presidential primaries. An allegation the majority uh, uh, and deputy whip uh, will not take kindly to. So just listen to the exchange on the floor of the House earlier today. Over 40% of you rejected him, yet you want him to be the one giving us a future. In fact, did you, in fact, he lost in your constituency, Honorable Lydia. So what is your point? The vice president lost in your constituency. I don't even know what you are standing up to do. Did he not lose in your constituency? He lost. He lost even uh, Honorable Afenio's constituency. You and him didn't vote for him. As for majority leader, he probably voted for him because he wanted to be running me. But you didn't vote for him. You did not vote for him. So sit down, sit down. You can talk. You cannot talk. You, you talk. You sit down. Mr. Speaker. Majority Let's go to leader, that. Please, majority leader is on his feet. Yes, please. Mr. Speaker, I don't know why my colleagues, my colleagues, anytime they get up, they want to really link me up with something, rally mate, whatever. Mr. Speaker, yes, my colleague, the former minority leader, or saying that I'm concentrating on um, my running mate campaign. Mr. Yes, Speaker, let me, let, me, let me state it here clearly that there is no contest for the position of a running mate. And I'm not, I'm not involved in campaigning for running mate position. Mr. Yes, Speaker, it should be loud and clear. It should be loud and clear. And my colleague should also not involve himself in, in uh, you know, conjectures. He says, I probably voted for the vice president of my constituency. What has that got to do with the, with the, with the budget? I mean, speaker. Objection to what Honorable uh, uh, just did. It is an attack on me, and I want him to redraw that now. I am serious about this. You cannot do this to me on the floor of the house. We are, I take serious objection to that. And you better, you cannot start the campaign here on the floor of the house. It is serious, and I want you to redraw it now. Oh dear, the result of the presidential primaries from Ayawa so West Wakon. Uh, Honourable, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Honourable Majority Leader, yeah, you, haven't, Speaker, you said, haven't answered my question. Yes, I'm going to answer the question. I said, Honourable Baumia, Dr. Baumia Bonsu, Honourable Dr. Baumia Bonsu, 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 Dr. Baumia The heated exchanges there uh, between the minority chief whip, uh, Kwame Gavin Zaboja, and also the majority leader, Osei Chairman Zabunsu, and the deputy majority whip, Lydia Al Hassan. Uh, but the minority in parliament is also challenging claims by Chairperson of the Roads and uh, Transport Committee, uh, Kennedy Osei Nyako, that uh, President Akufando's government has made the biggest investment in the road sector, debating the budget in parliament, majority chief whip, and former ranking member on the Roads uh, Committee described the claims as lies. He has also been accusing the government of causing financial loss to the state in the road sector. The majority leader has served this country for a very long time. In this house, I was one of those people who stood and supported the bill to, to pass an agreement for a loan a, agreement to build a, a Swami interchange. And we cautioned that once we do this, the government will do the needful. Mr. Speaker, the fact remains, as we speak, there's evidence of demonstrations against a very, in fact, 
He's, you are the only person senior to him in this house. In his constituency, as we speak, the Swami Interchange Project is not going on. Is it true or not? And Pakadan Railway. Simply because they want to build a bridge over the water. But Mr. Speaker, what they have basically done is to turn the alignment of the railway to nowhere. The railway has been complete, have been at 98% complete for a, a long period. In fact, when a project is 98 complete, it's substantially completed to be handed over. Mr. Speaker, do you know why they cannot take it over? Because when you take the goods to Mpakadan, you can't do anything with it. If we're going to Akosombo, we can put them on the batch. So you have actually caused financial loss to the state. This is a summary of disaster. Nobody in Ghana wants to wake up thinking that you will get a false haircut. Nobody wants to be in this country to feel that he would wake up and, and, be, and be told that you cannot... But last minute, Mr. Speaker, let me ask you this. Have you remembered, can you remember these things? I shall protect the public first. I am too old to, to, uh, to, uh, to steal your money. Yet, yet the council, I come here. Try me and see. I am not a corrupt person. We don't need to tow the, the we, we don't need to take loans. We can just tow the, road, the, the zero sections of the road and get money to build our roads. I will transform Ghana in 18, 18 months. I will not operate family, family and friends government. I will make Kole Lagoon and Ador River Tory sites. I will give each constituency $5 million a year. Hey. I will arrest the dollar. Hey. A hike in fuel prices will be a thing of the past. Hey. I will make a crowd a cleaner city in, in, the, in Africa. Hey. I will build in, uh, 101 district hospitals in 18 months. Hey. I will build 315 new secondary schools. Hey. I will never go to IMF. Interesting uh, thoughts there. Uh, our main man in parliament, uh, Kweku Asante, is joining us now. He's had through all of these uh, heated exchanges. And Kweku, uh, the lunch minister, used the time also to uh, clarify some issues. The claims by uh, the parliamentary service uh, office that the clerk to parliament's uh, official uh, residence has also been sold under this government. What more do we know? Following that claim by the Speaker of Parliament that there was an attempt to sell off his um, um, official residence, um, the Lands Ministry put out a statement saying they were going to investigate. There was a follow-up statement by the Parliamentary Service claiming that the official residence of the clerk to Parliament was almost sold and actually has now been sold in 2019. He used opportunity today, the Lands Minister Samuel Abu Jinapo, to actually say that that was not true and that, yes, the property belonging to parliament, which is used to house the clerk to parliament, was indeed sold, but in 2015 and not in 2019 under an NPP government. Let's listen. UNESCO land, Mr. Speaker, UNESCO land is not being sold. UNESCO is in possession. And Mr. Speaker, as I said, that in many cases, in many cases, Mr. Speaker, when they make the claim, that a particular land is being sold under a particular administration. When you go into the records and you make the inquiry, you find the country. Mr. Speaker, I'll give an example. Not too long ago, it was said that the accommodation or residence of the clerk of parliament was sold in 2019. Mr. Speaker, I want to submit to this house, a house of record, and I want hands up to capture it, that my checks at the Lands Commission suggest that the clerk of parliament accommodation or residence was sold in 2015 and not 2019. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, yeah. Mr. Speaker, the then Minister for Works, the then Minister for Works and Housing, gave an offer to a private developer in 2015. A lease was granted to the developer in 2015. These records are unimpeachable. It happened in 2015 and not 2019. It just so happened. It just so happened that the developer, having bought the land in 2015, having been given an offer letter in 2015, having been granted a lease in 2015, took possession in 2019. So by all intents and purposes, Mr. Speaker, the land was sold in 2015 and not Thank 2019. Thank you. Uh, and let's talk about the head, uh, the, the health sector, I should be uh, saying now, uh, knowing so well that, uh, of course, that also uh, featured prominently today, uh, the chairperson of the health committee uh, talking about Agenda 111. This has been the president's promise to build um, a 
the hospital facility in districts where there are none? Well, yes, um, Dr. Nana, you were free today on the floor, conceded that no government can build 111 hospitals in four years. And in fact, one, the question one would ask is, if that was so, why did the president make the promise to build it before the end of the tenor? He now admits that that promise cannot be met and that Ghanaians should not expect that all Agenda 111 hospitals will be completed by the end of 2024. Yahweh says, the projects that are at various stages of completion across the country will provide more than 6,000 jobs when mm. they are completed. We provided certain updates on various facilities across the country. Talk about the Achiamansa, one which, which he says is more than 60%. And a number of facilities that are being constructed across the country, which he claims are various stages of completion, almost all of them more than 60% in his own words. And the expectation is that by the end of 2024, those ones that will be ready will be commissioned by the president. But he admits today that they cannot complete all the 111 as they promised by the end of the season before the election. Uh, quick question to your parliamentary correspondent giving us the latest uh, because it's been a busy day in the House with the uh, par parliamentary caucus from the minority side also indicating further that President Akufando must immediately cause the withdrawal of a regulation seeking to restrict a number of items. The uh, importation uh, when it comes to rice, fruit juice, margarine, cement and also fish. We have sugar in there and some 16 other strategic products. The trade minister who is pushing this very regulation hopes it will uh, help um, the CD appreciate and grow local industries. Per the regulation, any person seeking to import the selected items and products will require permission from the trades minister. Addressing journalists, the minority leadership described the regulation as a bad policy which must be withdrawn immediately. Going forward, if you want to import rice, sugar, diapers, pottery, and a number of items, approximately 22 selected items, you will need to go to the Ministry of Trade and Industry and to see a committee that will be constituted by the minister before a permit will be given to, uh, to you. This, I think, is a dangerous practice. It has happened before in this country. And you recall that in 1967, a commission of inquiry was established. Justice Olenu's committee was established. And that committee was to identify the corruption and more practices relating to import licenses. The report was clear that that practice is outmoded and it cannot be continued because people use it for the purposes of rent seeking. This government is taking us back to 1967 once again, President Takufuado. I'm worried that a time will come if you are not an MPP member, you will not even get a license to import something to this economy. That is unacceptable. Ghana is a member of the World Trade Organization. This practice, the World Trade Organization frowns, frowns upon it. And it's a clear violation of the practices of world trade and international trade. And it should not happen. We are urging His Excellency the President to have a rethink because this is not a policy that we should encourage, and they have to redraw it. In fact, we in the NDC will criticize it, and we'll do whatever it takes. But the only problem we have is that the Constitution plays a limitation on us, because it is an ally, and it will mean that it can be laid without us having any major restrict, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 input. Well, as Black Friday, the shopping bonanza approaches, ensuring your safety amidst the frenzy of the deals and the discounts uh, becomes paramount. We'll tell you how to shop smart and also stay secure during uh, this highly anticipated uh, retail rush. Uh, we have more for you in this package. In today's interconnected world, assessing goods and services is just a click away. As we approach this year's end, the online shopping spree is on 
and folks everywhere are scouting the web for those irresistible deals. Major retailers are dropping prices by up to 50% on various items, making it the perfect time to snag some steals. But in the midst of this shopping frenzy, scammers are also out in full force. You spot a great deal online, make the purchase, pay, but the package never arrives. This could mean you fall in for one of the common scamming schemes. So she paid and she never like had or got the item and the person changed the handle. You couldn't find the person. Ruth's sister was a victim. To the vendor she was like, you pay before you deliver. My sister was like, oh, okay, no problem. So she paid and she never like had or got the item and the person changed the handle. You couldn't find the person, the contact wasn't going through, everything, like, full scam. Others pay for something online and end up receiving either a counterfeit version or an entirely different item altogether. Kweku knows this all too well. When it came, the sizes wasn't the, act the actual sizes I ordered. It was online, it was you. if you don't make your ID, it was you. So, if you know be somebody I know, if you know be somebody I know, say make a risk, then buy from someone I don't know there. But without that one, you know, get me. Charlie, I be guy man, you want guy guy man. Others would rather order products from international partners than order them locally for fear of being scammed. It was okay. I bought, I think, uh, my first time was AliExpress. Maybe for Ghana, I've not tried Ghana online something before, but what I did was an international something. So it, so it was okay. Yeah. Uh, the tracking was only, I think, safety something. I'll wait to make I maybe I'll go to From January to October alone, more than 300 cases of online fraud involving almost one million million Ghana cities have been reported to the Cyber Security Authority. With Black Friday starting November 24, these are expected to go up. So if you look at last year, at around the end of October, we had around 159 cases of online fraud. But this year, we had 320. It's just practically a double of that number. Stephen Kujo is an officer with the Cyber Security Authority. He elaborates on the common schemes used by fraudsters. Very common one is the bit about seeing an advertisement of an online shop or a supposed online shop on the platforms like uh, Instagram or Facebook. And typically when you engage, they'll, they'll tell you, okay, this product that you want to buy costs so and so. Please send the, the payment to a certain normal number. The payment is done and then the delivery never happens. Another approach that has come up in the last few months where some of these scammers would pick out a brand, a known brand that people are already engaging with, a food joint or something of the sort, then they'll go create a Google map entry. As if it's there, as if that, that location is there, to so attach contact numbers. And essentially what then they do is they'll boost that uh, contact so that it looks like it's legitimate. Stephen explained how to stay safe while you surf the internet for the best deals. A typical consumer, the precaution there is don't just take that advertisement you see at face value. You need to check whether it's a genuine business. One way to do this is to check whether you actually have a physical store, a physical office at least, where you could be able to engage them. Assuming whatever you bought, you have an issue and need to return it. The other thing we also recommend is in doing such purchases, you would want to insist on payment after delivery. So don't just pay off and, and, and hope they'll bring it. Make sure you are able to insist on only paying when you have received whatever you're ordering and had a chance to inspect it. As you hunt for the best deals and browse online, remember to prioritize safety and verify the authenticity of offers. Happy shopping. For Joy News, Caleb Zablim and Ethan Lai. And you're still watching the Policy on Journey channel. We're taking a break. Uh, we're also looking forward uh, to the grand opening of uh, this year's uh, Join News Ecobank uh, Habitat Fair. We'll be crossing you over shortly to the uh, Accra International Conference Centre, uh, where, of course, uh, there will be 
uh, the opening of the fair that will give you the opportunity to a number of uh, matters relating to housing and perhaps for those of you who want to rent as well there's an opportunity for you just stay with us i will take you there shortly <laughs>